Amen. Thank you, Josh and Ray. I was admiring that old Telecaster guitar that Ray is playing. It's so worn and everything, and uh, I, I admire guys that can play instruments. I, I really do. And so, uh, thank you so very much. Thank you for being here today. Open your Bibles to Acts chapter 1, the first chapter of Acts, and we're going to continue in our journey toward Pentecost. And today's message is entitled, The Same Jesus. Now, I want to make a disclaimer at the first of it. Anytime you get to talking about the second coming, you've got more opinions than Carter has liver pills. And so I'm well aware of the theologies and the historical theologies and the ones I agree with and the ones I don't agree with. And somebody always says, well, the Bible says. That's exactly right. The Bible says. But are you accurately interpreting what the Bible says? Now, that's the challenge for every one of us. And so I know the different schools of theology and where they came from and how long they have been in historical theology and the church. And it's very, very fascinating to go back and study the church fathers, those guys from North Africa and uh, in the Middle East and areas that were in those few hundred years after uh, the first century and the apostles. So uh, if, I don't, if I don't preach your favorite scheme, just be aware I'm preaching the text. And we're going to deal with the text that's in front of us. And uh, that's not to disregard anyone or to disparage anyone because there are very conservative scholars that have disagreement as to the method and all of the goings-on related to the second coming of Christ, Israel, the church, etc., etc. But that's not what's important before us today. That's not what Jesus was leaving with the disciples. And so we want to go into that in this particular passage. In Acts chapter 1, verse 9 and following, he said, after he said this, he was taken up before their very eyes, and a cloud hid him from their sight. They were looking intently up into the sky as he was going, when suddenly, oh, if you've never done a study on the suddenlies of God, I would encourage you to do that. Get you a good, strong, or young concordance and look up that word suddenly and look at all of those scriptures throughout scripture. When suddenly two men in white stood beside them, men of Galilee, they said, why do you stand here looking into the sky? This same Jesus who has been taken from you into the heaven will come back in the same way you have seen him go into heaven. Have you ever been to a class re high school class reunion? 30 years later, 40 years later, 50. Have you ever noticed how fat and old people have gotten? I mean, changes, right? I, and, and we see those in reunions. And I, I wonder sometimes if the apostles, being men, and those 120 in the upper room, I wonder sometimes what they thought. This same Jesus will come as you've seen him go. I wonder what they thought. I wonder if they had any inclination of the tremendous changes that would take place in much of the world, and yet some things remain unchanged. For example, the nature of man remains unchanged. But the fastest they could travel was however fast a donkey or a camel could run. And today we have jet airplanes. And I read the other day where they're working on one that uh, is more like the old supersonic plane uh, years ago that British Air flew. And when uh, we were raising our kids in DFW area, believe it or not, I would take my Bible, and this was my solace place. I would go out to the airport property and back in an old cemetery that was on airport property and sit there and watch the Concord come in and land unbelievable that that thing got off the ground, flew as fast as it did. I, I don't think the apostles had any idea of those kinds of changes. And I don't think we have any idea what kinds of changes may happen in the future. But here's the thing that is true. Jesus promised that he was coming again. 
He gave us that promise. And I want us to look at this passage and break it down a little bit because the promise of God is our hope. Now, we may have hope in a lot of things, but the real hope that you and I have is in the promise of God. Listen to how Scripture, we read uh, from Luke's Gospel just a few moments ago, and we'll refer back to that in a minute, but uh, in chapter 24 of Luke's Gospel, Jesus is walking on the road to Emmaus, and uh, he's warming the hearts of these disciples. And he's telling them about himself, and he refers to himself, and in the last few verses, uh, he talks about his ascension, and we'll look at the ascension more on Ascension Sunday. But he does that. And then in 1 Timothy, one of the great writers, when Paul is writing the young preacher Timothy, he says in chapter 4, verse 1, the Spirit clearly says that in latter times, some will abandon the faith and follow deceiving spirits, things taught by demons. Such teachings come through hypocritical liars whose consciences have been seared with a hot iron. They forbid people to marry and order them to abstain from certain foods which God created to be received with thanksgiving by those who believe and who know the truth. For everything God created is good and nothing is to be rejected if it's received with thanksgiving because it is consecrated by the word of God in prayer. There will be people in the name of religion that will tell you what you can and cannot eat. Now, I'm not talking about healthy stuff. I'm, I'm not talking about a doctor telling us to cool it on the candy bars, things of that nature. But what we're talking about is a formal ritualistic diet that in order to please God, in order to be a, a good follower of God, this is what you have to do. And that kind of deception will be in the last days. And, and then he goes on in 2 Timothy, writing again, and says, but mark this, there will be terrible times in the last days. People will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boastful, proud, abusive, disobedient to their parents, ungrateful, unholy, without love, unforgiving, slanderous, without self-control, brutal, not lovers of the good, treacherous, rash, conceited, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, having a form of godliness but denying its power, have nothing to do with such person. And all through the church, we see people who fit this category. We see people who deny the power of God. Oh, the Holy Spirit, well, that was for the first century. That's not for now. You're a mystic if you believe in that. All kinds of things like that. I, I will tell you that Scripture and God's truth is objective truth. There's no question about that, but it's more. Because the Holy Spirit indwells us and the Holy Spirit leads us and guides us. And Jesus said in John 16 that he would guide us into all truth. And so is, there's the Word and there's the Spirit. And Paul warned against those that would deny the Spirit. And then he says in Titus chapter 2 and verse 13, uh, actually, verse 11, for the grace of God has appeared that offers salvation to all people. It teaches us to say no to ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in this present age while we wait for the blessed hope, the blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. And so here in this particular age that we've just read characteristics of the age you and I live in, and yet Paul is telling us we wait patiently for the blessed hope. The coming of the Lord Jesus Christ is the blessed hope. That trumps any method, any school of thought, anything that we might have, because honestly, those are tertiary, and down through the history, there are great and godly men and women who have disagreed. For example, dispensational theology, Dallas Theological Seminary, Lewis Berry Schaefer founded that school. Our daughter graduates. We're going to fly up uh, in a couple of weeks on uh, Thursday night and fly back on Saturday, but we're going to watch her graduate. It's a great school, and I'm not critical of that school at all. Wonderful school, but even that school has had some changes, although they remain premillennial. And then coming out of the Reformation, you have the covenantal theology. 
of which men like John Piper, Leslie Sproul, all kinds of guys we could name that are in different schools of thought. So we're not going to differ over that because there are great men and women of God that interpret Scripture differently. But the one overarching thing that we all must believe is the blessed hope. The Lord Jesus is coming again. That's the bottom line. And so here, Paul gives characteristics that I've been around the globe. I've been on five continents, and I'm not bragging about that, but I'm telling you, I've seen this world. I've seen the inner city. I've worked in the inner city, and if ever there was an age in our lifetime that fits these characteristics that Paul is talking about, we live in it now. I don't know when Jesus is coming again. But I know that our age characterizes these things. And in the process of all of that, Scripture tells us again in Hebrews chapter 9, verse 28, that Christ was sacrificed once to take away the sins of many, and He will appear a second time, not to bear sin, but to bring salvation to those who are waiting for Him. You say, Pastor, we're not saved now when we trust Christ. We're not saved. Yes, we are. We are delivered from the penalty of sin the moment we trust the Lord Jesus. Jesus Christ. As we live and grow in Christ, we are delivered from the dominance of sin. But when Jesus comes, we will be delivered from the presence of sin. That's salvation. It's threefold. And yes, if you know Jesus, your eternity is just as secure as if you'd been in heaven a thousand years. But we've got to grow. We learn. We serve. All of that is in this present age. At the same time, right beside us is this deep, dark world that we're talking about. And we read in our text from Luke chapter 24, the very last few words, remember Lot's wife. Why do you think Jesus said that to us? Lot and his family was to be delivered out of Sodom. Judgment was coming, and they were to be delivered, and we will be delivered from the wrath of God at the end of the age. But in that, Lot's wife, the only word said about her in the Bible is she looked back. I wonder how many of us in this room are looking back. We're looking back to the past for whatever the reasons. And we're not focused on the future. Had she been focused on the future, she would have been delivered because she was Lot's wife. And God was bringing them out. And so when you look at all of these things, there's not only a witness to us, but there is a warning to us. And that warning is to remember Lot's wife. But our hope is in the promise of God, the blessed hope. The Lord Jesus Christ is coming again. And and then I want you to see in this not only the promise of God, but I want you to see in that promise the testimony. There's a threefold testimony in this text. And one of the testimonies to the truth of what he's saying are the angels, these two men. Now, I've heard testimony by people that I really respect. And they're rare, not not rare that I respect, but rare that I've heard this testimony of people actually seeing angels. I've heard some goofy stories too, just like you have. But some people that I really have respect for have testified at different times in different crisis situations of seeing angels. We have a whole scripture that talks about angels coming and appearing to man. And so we know that the angelic presence that's in this, uh, two men dressed in white stood beside them, men of Galilee, they said, why do you stand here looking into the sky? They were gazing. And the picture is that God lifted Jesus. It was just like he was just lifted up and into this cloud that hit his presence and delivered him into the heavens. And all of these were standing there gazing. And the two men, angelic beings, appear. Why? This same Jesus 
will come again in like manner. And, and so the angels give testimony. Not only that, but the Scripture gives testimony. I love what Peter said. Peter was standing there watching, but when he wrote his book in 1 Peter, or actually 2 Peter in chapter 1, verses 16 through 21, you can read it when you get home. But he talks about, we have not followed cleverly devised tales. We were witnesses of his glory. And then he goes on and he says, we have a more sure word of prophecy. In other words, we have a more sure word than somebody's testimony. And that is the word of God. 66 books written over 1,600 years, canonized over the first of three centuries uh, since Jesus and into what we call our Bible, those 66 books that we have, Old Testament and New Testament. And we have the witness of Scripture that affirms the coming again of the Lord Jesus Christ. And not only that, but we have the words of Jesus himself uh, in the Gospels in John chapter 14 in that upper room discourse. When Jesus is looking at his disciples, he told them, he said, if I go away, I'll prepare a place for you. And I will come again and receive you unto myself that where I am, there you may be also. I don't know where there is, but I know it's in the presence of Jesus. Isn't that good enough? I, I grew up in an area of saints of God, poor. I mean, we, we really were. Most of the people were just common, poor working folks, and there's nothing wrong with that, then or now. But to think of heaven when you lived in a rent shack, And to think of the glory of God when you worked hard all day on the farm or someplace like that, they would sing about it. They would sing when we all get to heaven. I'll fly away. I have a mansion over the hilltop. They would sing of the streets of gold. Now, I'm a little boy growing up in that and I didn't know much about the value of gold, don't know much about it now, and certainly don't have much. But um, I've never been impressed to know that I could have a mansion or to know that I could walk on streets of gold. But I have been impressed that in the presence of the Lord Jesus for all eternity, those negative things we grapple with every single day will not be there. They'll not be there. And I like to go barefoot, but I hate stickers. And so I go barefoot in the house. But I tell you, here's my vision of the mansion. I want a little cabin. I want my family and friends somewhere close. I want that little cabin with a front porch and a rocker and to look out at the ocean and a little sandy beach. I want to go on the back porch with a little rocker and look up at a mountain. Have the best of both worlds. I want grass that I can go barefoot. Now, that's just me in my heart. Is that what my mansion is going to be like? No, I would have no idea. But I'm telling you, what will trump that, what will be more important than that is wherever we are, we're going to be with Jesus. That's what counts. That's what counts. That's the testimony that's in this passage. And, and then let's go to the second aspect of that. Uh, the angel looked at them and said, this same Jesus, this same Jesus. Well, what makes that so special? He was in his resurrected body when he ascended into heaven. The Jesus they talked about and walked with and looked at had a different kind of body than the Jesus that was crucified. The resurrected Jesus had his resurrection body. And we will see him. We will behold the nail prints in his hand. 
we will see him in his glorified resurrection body. And you and I too in those days will be raised from the dead and have a resurrection body unless he comes while we're alive. And we'll be caught up, is the words of scripture, to meet him in the air and be with him forever. You think about that. A resurrected body. A new covenant that in his shed blood at the cross means that you and I cannot work our way to heaven. It's impossible for us to do that and God doesn't require it, but he simply requires us to put our faith and trust in Jesus because he laid on Jesus all of the sin of us all. And I want to tell you, Lance and I have had this discussion in times past, but as I was looking at this, Lance, over and over and over, it really is hard to wrap a human mind around the fact that when Jesus died on the cross and I trusted him as my Lord and Savior, every sin that I had ever committed, ever would commit, were placed under his blood. I'm free. I'm not free to sin. I'm free from sin. I will never stand before God, nor will you, if you know Jesus, and give an account for your sins. Jesus paid it all. All to him we owe. Sin had left a crimson stain, but he washed it white as snow with his blood. It is this same Jesus coming again. It is this same Jesus that is the Davidic king of Old Testament prophecy that will sit on the throne of David forever. And the new Jerusalem, that at one time Jerusalem was the Jewish city, but in Ephesians chapter 2, the middle wall of partition has been struck down and now it's all of our city. In Christ, in Christ, this same Jesus, the Messiah, the Davidic King, the long-expected Emmanuel, and he's coming in the same way, this same Jesus, come again in the same way that you've seen him go. I don't know when that'll be. There's a whole lot of other scriptures that talk about things that are going to fit in that. I believe there's going to be a trumpet blast. We're going to be caught up to meet him. We're going to be with him. There will be a time in his return in Zechariah chapter 14 and verse 4. uh, The Old Testament prophet is talking not only about things that happened, I believe, in 12 through 14, the things that have been fulfilled, but he's also talking about things yet to be fulfilled. And in chapter 14, verse 2, uh, he says, I will gather all the nations to Jerusalem to fight against it. The city will be captured, the houses ransacked, and the women raped. Half the city will go into exile, but the rest of the people will not be taken from the city. Then the Lord will go out and fight against these nations as he fights on a day of battle on that day his feet will stand on the Mount of Olives east of Jerusalem and the Mount of Olives will be split in two from east to west forming a great valley with half the mountain moving north and half moving south and when Jesus ascended he ascended from the Mount of Olives so I have every biblical reason to believe if he's the same Jesus coming in the same way that's where he's coming. I don't know when. I don't know how. I don't know how every eye will see, but that's just, that's just pity, pity um, penny any stuff for a living God. God can do anything but fail. And you're not going to miss the second coming of Jesus. Paul taught his generation Not to believe anyone that says a resurrection is past, this is past, that's past. And he described in Thessalonians some things that would be like I've described from other scriptures. But I want to tell you folks, our hope is the blessed hope. This same Jesus will come again in like manner. And Jesus said, I will receive you unto myself that where I am, 
there you may be also. Now, when John wrote Revelation, and oh, you can get into war in churches interpreting Revelation. I never understood that. In chapter 1, Jesus promises a blessing to anyone who reads the book. He didn't say, I'm going to bless you if you understand everything. You don't have to name every frog in Revelation to be blessed. He said, I'm going to bless you if you read it. And I frequently read the book of Revelation, preferably out loud. I don't do that. I, I sit and read. When John finished all the things that had been revealed to him, the very last words he said in chapter 22 in the old version, even so, come, Lord Jesus. So whatever the differences of interpretation, whatever is going to go on in the world and what's happening now and whether this is the end or whether the end is down there another millennium, we do not know. We're told it's not for us to know the times and the seasons. Now that ought to settle a lot of debates. But we're told this same Jesus is going to come in the same way. And he is our blessed hope. Now, my question to you is twofold. One, do you have that hope in your heart? Have you given your life to Jesus? And two, are you living for him? Or have you gotten sidetracked? And Maybe today you need to come back. You may need to come to him. You may need to come back to him. And I want to give you an opportunity right now. I want to ask us to bow our heads for prayer. And while we uh, are in prayer, I'm going to ask you who are believers that would just simply say, Lord Jesus, I haven't put you on the front burner. I've become a whole lot like some of these that the pastor read about from Scripture. I want to repent of that, and I want to become a fully devoted follower of the Lord Jesus Christ. Cleanse me of everything that displeases you and help me live for you. You may be here and you've never really trusted Jesus. We want to give you an opportunity to do that. We want to do it in a several different ways. I'm going to lead you in a prayer in a moment. And I'm going to ask you to get up out of your seat and today acknowledge that this day, Pastor, I'm giving my life to Jesus. And I want to acknowledge that. And I want to follow Him. And we don't know who you are. So would you identify yourself? And when we stand in a moment to sing our hymn of invitation, I want you to get up out of your seat and come and meet myself or Lance here at the front. And we have ladies that can pray with you if you're a lady. We actually have a prayer room. We can go back and pray with you in the prayer room, politely, quietly, and privately. And after the service is over, even, if you're saying, I, I need to talk to someone, I'll, I'll be somewhere around the front. Lance will be here. Some of our ladies on our prayer team will be here. And we'll be happy to pray with you. We'll be happy to visit with you privately. Don't leave this room without obeying God. Whatever it might be, we're here to help. And if you've never trusted Christ, reach out to Him in your heart right now and just say, Lord Jesus, I believe you died on the cross for my sin. I believe you were buried. I believe you were raised from the dead. I admit I'm a sinner and I cannot save myself. Come into my life right now. Lord, save me. Fill me with your Spirit. Help me live for you. And I trust you. And I will confess Jesus is Lord. And Father, for those who prayed, who needed to pray, whichever prayer, I ask in Jesus' name that you would deal with them and lead them by your Spirit to make the decision that you're leading them to make. God, draw us all closer to you. And we ask it in Jesus' name. For we know this same Jesus 
is coming in the same way. And we say with John, even so, come, Lord Jesus.